there was a head shop next to this bus stop. They had Rolling Stone in a glass case. It must be 18 to buy this. But it was one of those places, it was like ye old head shop, S-H-O-P-P-E. And I would, I would go in there and like see the new Rolling Stone and eventually they let me buy it. And that was how I first started to read Rolling Stone. And how old were you then? 14. Right. A lucky 14. <laughs> <laughs> there was a generation that started the magazine, but had grown a little bit away from what it had become and what rock had become. Mid 70s, there were all these other bands, you know, who, who wants to write about Deep Purple? And I would be like, I will write about Deep Purple. In fact, I will spend weeks writing about Deep Purple. I will, I will be your Deep Purple man. It's kind of, it's vaguely threatening, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a bit yeah. too uh, anonymous over there. Yeah. Um, guys, I, I, I watched this yesterday, all, both parts, all four hours. I loved it. I love how you compiled the story, uh, how you mixed pop culture with political in the same way that Rolling Stone has done for 50 years. So talk about uh, how this started and what your sort of first approach to the material was when you thought of doing this doc. Well, I think, I mean, we were originally approached, actually, by Jan Wenner to see how, if we'd be interested in doing it. And my, uh, I was initially hesitant because I didn't really want to do a special, you know, interviewing a lot of celebrities. Oh, Rolling Stone was so great and so forth and so on. But particularly in this moment in time when journalism economically is so uh, under attack uh, and also it's under attack politically as well, I thought it'd be great to celebrate the writing and the writers of this magazine over the last 50 years, because it's fantastic. You dig into it, uh, you know, from Hunter Thompson to Tom Wolfe to Matt Taibbi to other people. You know, it's just great stuff. And so it seemed like a moment in time to celebrate that. Well, even in that clip, we don't see the part of that clip where Cameron talks about uh, Jan Wenner pulling him into his office and saying, basically, you know, your, your journalism is bad. That's not what we do. Take a look at Slouching Towards Bethlehem and think about Joan Didion and that approach to journalism. And that's kind of where the documentary is coming from as well, is sort of talking about journalism of that day in, in relation to Joan Didion moving up towards now and into today. When did you start to focus? I mean, was that initially focusing on the writers? Was that what got you into the documentary? That was built in from the start. And we really just started by reading the magazine. I mean, we read, Jan gave us, he has all the early years bound and he gave us, we got to see the physical magazine, which was fun, and looking at all the ads and, and going through, and we just started reading and reading and reading and really developed a deep appreciation for the breadth of quality writing that the magazine's done over the years. One of my favorite moments in the documentary is a moment where, and I think it's around the late 90s and maybe before that, when they start talking about how people say the magazine isn't as good now as it was when I was younger, and Jan basically says, if you look back over the course of the magazine over its entire existence, you'll see that we covered pop stars that may not have been on the cutting edge, but they were, you know, they were pop stars of that time. Yet behind all of that is the writing of Matt Taibbi, the writing of Cameron Crowe, or you know, of Hunter S. Thompson is sort of behind the front page somewhere. So Rolling Stone has this amazing breadth of coverage from the most mainstream to the sort of most off the cuff, off the beaten path political writing. Did you feel like you had to merge the two there as well as filmmakers? I mean, you can focus on the writing, but then you also have to talk about Britney Spears or NSYNC. Well, and, and, and we profiled the music pretty heavily and, and, uh, and also we're looking for great live performances because I think one of the things that was inspiring about the magazine was how inspired the writers were by the music. You know, they were so compelled by it that they had to write something about it. So to give a sense of that kind of visceral excitement, you know, we, we did a, a, you know, a lovely section on Ike and Tina Turner yeah. and man, you know, you, you, you can really hear them bring it, and, and, and we give that a lot of space. Or the young Bruce Springsteen, you really feel it, and, and so you feel the heat that the writers felt when they responded to it, and that was very much part of trying to find that mix between the writing and the music. I'd imagine telling the story of Ike and Tina Turner as well in the short period of time that you have, both how influential and amazing they were, plus what was going on behind the scenes and how destructive and horrible it was, it was you know, it's hard to strike that balance in telling that story. Can you talk about that a little bit? We actually struggled a lot with that story. And at one point, we thought we might do it in two parts because it's actually very instrumental in Tina's story. Tina starts to talk about what happened to her personally in Rolling Stone magazine in the 80s. And because Rolling Stone was a place where artists could go and knew they would be respected, 
and that they would be treated um, well and that they felt they could be honest. And so at one point we thought, well, maybe we'll do this in two parts. It's a challenging story to tell, and I think the way that we ended up doing it where we start to hint at it toward the end, and it's very clear how she she has a line. We have an interview um, f with her in Benfang Torres, and she has a line that says, I treated me like a doll. And I think that kind of summed it up, and you see him sort of bossing her around in the studio. It starts to hint at where things are, what's going on behind the scenes. And talk about the, the John Lennon and Yoko stuff that's in the film as well. Incredible footage behind the scenes of, of them. I mean, one amazing piece of footage where he's berating a New York Times reporter who he's not, or she's trying to berate him, really. She's trying to berate him. him. She's trying to tell him uh, what she thinks he should do and why Give Peace a Chance was so infantile and stupid. He said she keeps saying, you're better than that. Um, and there's this incredible back and forth, and then <laughs> the New York Times reporter is so upset that John Lennon hasn't agreed with her that she gets up and walks out. He's like <laughs> the, the opposite of a Rolling Stone journalist. So, so that, um, so yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And, and one of the ways that 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 uh, John Lennon and Yoko got on early on with Rolling Stone was because of Annie Leibovitz, the photographer, and. They were impressed that Jan would send somebody so young, also a woman, who was, uh, who, who was not kind of the, the pro swaggering in and telling everybody what to do. She was somebody who would hang out and live with them and hang out with them and, 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 then, and then find moments of intimacy. And so over time, they got more and more comfortable, so much so that, you know, as it turned out, Anne Leibovitz was the one who shot the last photograph of John Lennon before he was killed. And one of the things that is a through line uh, throughout the doc from Michael Hastings back to the Cameron Crowe slouching towards Bethlehem thing is that we can get comfortable with these people, we can be friendly, but we're not fanboys. And the great thing about the Hastings piece in the film is that all of these guys thought that Hastings was their buddy and they just divulged all this information to him. When did you, did, when did you find that through line in terms of the journalism and how how good they were, how good their writers were at sort of getting close but remaining, uh, jour you know, separate journalistically. Well, I mean, I think that's the instructive part of that Cameron Crowe, Jan Wenner story. He's saying, look, you've written a piece, he was talking about a piece that Cameron Crowe wrote about Led Zeppelin. You, were, you wrote a piece as a kind of a fanboy. Mm -hmm. But that's not your job, is to please them. Your job is to write for your viewers, your audience. You know, that's who you really owe something to. So at the end of the day, you have to dig deeper both into what you think, because that's a very important part of a lot of what the Rolling Stone writers do. They put something themselves in. It's not objective. It's purposely subjective. But also to get inside and, 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 and find some larger meaning in what's really going on. And that extends from the music writing all the way through to the political writing. It's like, at the end of the day, you owe your livelihood to your readers, not to the people you're covering. Now, I'm curious about your music selections in, to, in the film because you don't necessarily go with, and Matt, I'm going to get to you in a second. I'm sorry. You're one of my favorite writers, but, I, you know, the filmmakers, I gotta, sure. I'll got to switch off in a second. Uh, when we get into the second part of the film, you're not using a lot of the most famous tracks that would really be talked about. I mean, there's a moment where we see NSYNC singing, but you have I Want to Be Adored. You have Only in Dreams by Weezer, which is a really off-the-beaten-path cut from, from that band. You could have used, like, Hash Pipe or something, you know, like... <laughs> What made you know where? What made you go with some of these songs? From the beginning, I think we, licensing fees, maybe. Sorry. Well, it, it is a factor, but no, I think from the beginning we were very aware, especially in part one. Uh, some of this is well-trod ground, and you hear the same songs again. You see the same footage again. So we were very conscious about making some decisions where you're not going to hear the same song that you hear in every documentary about the 60s or the 70s. And I think that carried over into the 80s, and it was really in 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 from the 80s on. Honestly, it was really what the story sort of dictated. You know, one of the approaches we had was that we just sort of picked songs and we would feed them to the editors. And I happened to like the Stone Roses back in the day when I was young, and I liked that song. And I thought, I think this is going to be in here somehow. I wasn't sure. And we have a great editors, and they paired this with a, a story about Jimmy Swaggart, who was evangelical so minister down by a sex scandal, and it was just perfect. And so some of it is just is, you know, great happenstance. 
And you know, you as we say this, it sounds like the the entire four hour documentary is just a love letter to the magazine, and and it's not necessarily that all the time. There is this great piece of the film where you one of the writers kind of, kind of takes the magazine to task for its coverage of hip hop and how it sort of gave Nirvana the cover over Public Enemy, and you play Public Enemy and you talk about hip hop a lot more in the film, I think, than you end up covering Nirvana. What was the conscious choice behind that? Why? It was essential to the conflict that was happening inside the magazine. I think it's it's both true to say that that people were rightly critical of the magazine for not covering certain things, whether it be hip hop or or earlier on, you know, whether it was punk, you know. But but also within the magazine, there was a willingness to argue about these issues and a willing to to embrace dissent. And it comes out later on in the most recent presidential campaign where there's. There's uh, Jan writes an endorsement of Hillary Clinton, and then Jan, uh, and then Matt writes a, a counter endorsement for for Bernie, and that's rare, you know, that you would get that kind of uh, lively internal dissent, which which I think made it great. But that said, I think you as filmmakers are both more interested in that section in Public Enemy than you are in in the story of Nirvana. Is that just because the story of Nirvana has been told? I mean, I think that's times? part of it. What really drove that section was the the interview with Ice T. Yeah. Ice T. Oh, it, the, he did an interview with Alan Light, with the writer that you're talking about around the cop killer controversy, and it's I strongly urge everyone to go and find it and read it. It reads as if he could have given the interview yesterday. It's incredible, and it's very prescient about a lot of things that were going on, and so we knew very early on that was something we wanted to include, and the public enemy kind of came out of that because we felt like, oh, this is part of this larger issue that's happening in the magazine right now, is that a lot of these issues aren't getting covered in the way that they should be, and Alan Light who did the Ice-T interview is, is really advocating for them. Yeah, and, and, we, and that takes it outside the magazine. And so I think we felt free to cover stuff that was going on. And if the magazine wasn't covering it, maybe we made a point about you know, why they should have. And actually, Alan was the one who was making that point. So uh, Public Enemy is just kind of cooler than Nirvana. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. Um, yeah. uh, Matt, how long have you been at Rolling Stone now? Since 2003. Since 2003. What were you first struck by when you started wor writing for Rolling Stone and working for working with Jan? Uh, how terrified I was to, you know, because I essentially had the same job. I was the first thing I was hired to do was do campaign trail reporting. So, um, you know, having grown up reading Hunter Thompson and Fear and Loathing on the campaign trail '72. Uh, I was really intimidated. The first time you walk into the office, you're surrounded by pictures um, uh, that Ralph Stebbin drew, uh, and the iconography of all of that is is uh, uh, around you at all times. So it's um, a, a little different than it is at other magazines. Uh, it's a little bit like being the Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, at um, at Rolling Stone, it's a it's an ongoing responsibility to have this particular job, and I was terrified by it. Dread Pirate Roberts from Princess Bride, or the one yeah. that ran the, uh, <laughs> the the drug the black market drug trade. Oh no, no the the Princess Bride one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know the the film uh, really. It, 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 it tell a lot of the film is dedicated to this past election and what this. Rightfully so. I mean, it's a historical election. It took every like a lot of things that had been sort of going like this in this country and finally brought them like this together. And a lot of that has to do with pop culture and politics. So many people say that this election was a lot like 72, and that's where the sort of political coverage really picks up with this. But you guys didn't necessarily draw that line too much and sort of draw the Nixon-Trump parallel did you think that it was there without having to say it too much or do you guys did you guys not see that as a as a parallel in making the film well actually i think we did see it as a parallel but it's not an exact parallel but but and um and and trump was much more of an outsider than nixon was who was representing the establishment in 72 but there is sort of this dark heart at, at the center of america this 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 kind of visceral anger that was something that Nixon, Nixon captured in 72, and I think Trump uh, captured uh, last year. So there is that. And also there was this pairing of how Rolling Stone covered it. And Matt was on the campaign trail covering it much like Hunter would, embedded, you know, covering really the Trump campaign, but also 
tagged with this wonderful illustrator, Victor Juhas, who was kind of the Ralph Steadman of, uh, of, of this era. So I think there are some parallels, and a lot of it has to do with how um, these politicians on the right were able to marshal this kind of inchoate anger in, in a way that was really, really powerful, but also very destructive. Marshal and, and exploit, I would yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Matt, what did it feel like being on the campaign trail for uh, this past election on the Trump campaign trail, especially when, as you just said, you know, you have Hunter Thompson and 72 sort of in your head. Did it feel similar to you? Did you feel like you were having to live up to something or did it feel a little like at some times, oh, this feels like shooting fish in a barrel compared to like going after the establishment? Um, this is my fourth campaign that I've covered for Rolling Stone and having always been uh, conscious of the t Hunter Thompson's writing. I think one of the things that happens to everybody, not just reporters at Rolling Stone, you find yourself, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, trying to shoehorn all the characters into the, into the cliches that Thompson established. So there's always sort of this angelic McGovern character. There's the, the, the Quisling-esque musky character. There's the evil Nixon character. But I, I never really felt that um, until this election. You know, when I when I saw uh, when I when I first saw Donald Trump, I understood what what Thompson felt when he looked at Nixon because Thompson was completely animated by Nixon. He even said in, in his obituary that his entire family was held together by their hatred by Nixon. <laughs> uh, and Many I, families could say the same of Trump right now, I'm sure. Yeah, and I, I didn't feel that. I, I mean, I kind of fell in hate with Trump right away, and I, I had never experienced that before. Fell in hate with him? Well, as a character, you know, I mean, he, uh, I, as a human being, I'm kind of, I hate to admit this, but I'm kind of indifferent to him. But uh, I, on the job, um, you know, it's not like I went out there and John McCain kept me up at night thinking, uh, you know, what a fascinating, horrible, you know, rich character he was. It wasn't like that. But Donald Trump, when I first saw him, I thought, I thought this is incredible. You know, it was it was amazing, and and I and I, and I hope it comes through in the writing that um, I wasn't I wasn't just condemning him. I was I was truly fascinated by him by by his repulsiveness and why he was succeeding and and the mystery of like why why it was happening, all that stuff. So yeah, I, I think I understood what what Thompson was going through because his his whole shtick with Nixon was the same thing. I think. Yeah, what I mean, you've spent a fair amount of your career, I think, uh, writing about the financial industry and financial crimes. And I think in some ways, uh, at the risk of using Donald Trump esque words right now, attacking the establishment and, you know, the, for lack of a better word, the elites of the establishment who have in many ways gotten away with a lot of crimes, be they financial crimes or ethics, you know, ethics violations in government. And Trump at one point seemed to sort of marshal, as, uh, as Alex said, the anger of a populace in regards to those things. So did you find yourself, even while watching this and sort of being surrounded by people who are no doubt yelling disgusting things at times, a certain amount of not camaraderie, but understanding of what of their Absolutely. feelings? Absolutely, yeah, because... Trump was this incredible contradiction on the one, he was very he was very different from Nixon as Alex said because he wasn't a creature of the establishment he wasn't like a, a figurehead resting atop this gigantic piece of machinery there was no machinery with Donald Trump it was just Trump and a couple of overheated ganglia behind his eyes you know <laughs> and that was the entire campaign he had no helpers nothing it was just him winging it and he was an outsider he was that was definitely true and the idea that he had found some kind of cheat code to break the whole system um was fascinating i you know and and i i watched it and i think unlike a lot of other reporters who just sort of looked down on him and, and thought, this is disgusting. Um, I, I, I found myself just totally compelled by the idea that, that this was happening and that it was, it was succeeding somehow, and why was that? One more question about this, and then we'll talk mostly about sure. the film again. I apologize. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of us who felt like the system needed a little bit of breaking, right? Mm -hmm. But do you experience, and I, I'm assuming that you, I think through your writing, I would assume that you felt a little bit of that as well, that the system needed a little bit of breaking. Do you experience a little bit of regret that maybe this sort of our, our fantasy of breaking the system a little bit maybe has, has gone too far? Like, can we yes. repair the parts that we need to repair at this point? 
Well, that was part of the horror of the whole thing is that when we finally got to the point where the populace became frustrated with this fake uh, campaign system that was where the deck was stacked against actual voters and it was really rigged in a very specific and, and complex way. When they finally rebelled successfully, the person they chose to to throw all their energy toward was was this person, Donald Trump. It was exactly the wrong person. You know, it would have been great to see, uh, you know, see it happen with Bernie because it was a very similar story on the other side. But Trump had this additional thing where he understood the media and he understood theatrics in a way that, that Bernie didn't, and that, that was the whole difference. Yeah. When you guys uh, started sort of linking the political to pop culture via either with Trump or, you know, because you're talking about both things at the same time, what kind of respect did you end up having for the magazine, especially in the 80s when they start getting criticized for, you know, being yuppies or in the late 90s they're getting criticized for covering boy bands and stuff like that? Did you find a new respect for the magazine at that moment? I think so. I mean, I, I think this whole process gave me a new respect for the magazine. You know, even in, in its worst tendencies where it was seemingly selling out and becoming over-commercialized, and you can see yawn change physically, you know, from the kind of scruffy... Um, California kid to some suddenly this you know uh, limousine liberal uh, publishing but, house yeah. publishing house guy traveling in limousines throughout you know New York, but all throughout that there was just this attentiveness to what's going on and and I think properly you know one of the editors along the way says yeah okay so we're looking at InSync we're looking at Britney Spears but that's because where the culture was going and and so that's what good magazines, that's what good journalism does. It follows the lead of what's happening rather than, you know, acting as a kind of arbiter of taste and saying this is what's good for you. Yeah. I was just going to add to, even in the 80s when they are starting to sell out and there's celebrity covers, I mean, Bill Greider, who's a very, very well seasoned, well respected journalist who was recommended to the magazine by Hunter Thompson is writing for them regularly very serious articles about the Reagan administration to the point where I was like, how can we can't do we can't include one of these and it's very these are very serious <laughs> stories it's it's very even though they've sold out they're still staying on the beat and doing the job now what has that been like for you when you write a very serious story about the trump campaign or about financial crimes and on the cover of the magazine is i don't know kid rock no, i have a funny story about that actually when i the the story i wrote about goldman that was sort of famous about, about the um the, you know the vampire squid uh, imagery I'm pretty sure that the Jonas Brothers were on the cover of that issue. And um, a, a member of Congress actually, in, in a committee hearing, held up uh, a copy of the story of, uh, of Goldman Sachs and was complaining about Goldman in Congress and said, L listen to this, and starts quoting from, the, from the, the story, but it's the Jonas Brothers on the cover, you know? <laughs> and I remember like seeing that and thinking, it, well, it, at least it was complimentary anyway, but still, it was it was pretty weird. Yeah, definitely. Does it feel like a lot of times, though, um, you know, maybe not the Jonas Brothers, but maybe an older celebrity might like might or an older rock star might lead someone to read your your articles that may not have read it before? Maybe a Jonas Brothers fan as well. Who knows? <laughs> definitely. I mean, I think going around over the years, um, you know, on book tours and things like that. It's pretty clear that a lot of my readers are from Jan's generation, uh, people who came to me b by way of um, the music that they used to listen to uh, that is still celebrated in the magazine uh, and would never, you know, would never have been reading an article about credit default swaps otherwise. Uh, but, you know, but, you know, so it's gratifying, definitely. Well, let's get some questions um, from the audience. Does anyone have a question right here? Hello. Um, from your personal perspective, out of all the stories that you've covered and all the artists that you've met, perhaps the stories you've written about, what do you think is the most, or to you, your favorite um, politician or star or r rock and roll star that was detrimental to our culture but was the most underrepresented? Specific niche. <laughs> Who's your favorite star? <laughs> Underrepresented. 
Well, I mean, I would go back to what we were talking about earlier. I do think rap and hip hop are very underrepresented in the magazine for a very long time, and it's not really until until the, sort of the mid '90s when it becomes mainstream that that the magazine really starts to take it seriously in the way that it should. So I definitely think Public Enemy should have been on the cover a lot sooner than it, than it, it was. It wasn't just the magazine, though. I mean, the rap and hip-hop in the 80s and even in the early 90s a little bit, there's that great clip of David Bowie in the 80s like chastising an MTV VJ, being like, why don't you play rap? And the guy's yeah. like, I don't know, I'm just a VJ. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt? For the very uh, first time. I mean, I don't think it's an accident. In the, in the movie, you see Jan talking about how he doesn't like the Sex Pistols, and then there's the whole thing about, you know, Public Enemy not being on the cover, and there is a kind of inherent, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, Jan is simpatico. He's with the pow with the way things are. He's uh, in, a, in a way that maybe he's probably not comfortable admitting. You know, I think he, he feels threatened by things that are genuinely dangerous, and and he has to be convinced doubly to 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 go into those areas. So, like for instance, he believes very strongly in the two party system, and he believes the Democrats are good, Republicans are bad, and um, and there's. It's hard to kind of get him away from 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 that paradigm, uh, and I think it's probably true with music too. He's just, you know, he grew up a certain way, and and uh, that's what he believes in, and it stayed. Well, if if I can think of something that was underrepresented in a way it was religion, but uh, some of the best stuff that Rolling that Rolling Stone has done has been about religion. Larry Wright, the guy who wrote the book about Scientology, yeah. did a wonderful piece about Jimmy Swaggart, which we included in the film. And also Janet Reitman uh, herself wrote some great pieces about Scientology. And that's not where you automatically think a counterculture magazine goes, but that it, it was going to that territory that I found so interesting. You know, and you, you, you get good, when you, when you approach that from a rock and roll perspective, you get some pretty interesting stuff. Was the 80s um, the beginning, just this has nothing to do with anything, I'm sorry, I'm just asking a curious question right now. Was the 80s the, because that's when I was born, I don't remember the heyday or the beginning of the televangelist, essentially. Like Jimmy Swagger was a televangelist for the most part, right? Yeah. And there was a number of them at that time. It was well, sort of an like incredibly a powerful, industry. I mean, I, I can't remember, the, what, what was the, how much was he making a week? I mean, it was just a staggering so amount of money. He was getting a million dollars a day. A million dollars a day. People were sending in their wedding rings. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're kind of used to televangelists. They have their Sunday morning spots or something. Mm -hmm. But at the time in the 80s, that was like the, the rise, I think. Well, and you'd see, I mean, it was like Stadia. You know, suddenly these massive numbers of people and, and a tremendous groundswell of political support where that televangelism was also beginning to touch into the political system and changing its, its, its core nature away from economic issues into these social issues. And it's very much sort of a counter to the counter-revolution, which is one reason we wanted to included in the film because this is sort of you know you have your counterculture and then now you have the counter to the counterculture uh, next question um, what were the major challenges of producing the film uh, and deciding what to put the most important because there is so much <laughs> there were a lot of challenges. I mean, one was, you know, including all the music, which was a huge licensing challenge, and also finding all the old footage and, uh, and photographs, which is Blair's genius. Um, but also the, the, the biggest problem was figuring out which stories to tell, because we didn't really want to do stone skipping. We didn't want to just say, okay, this is the 60s, this is the 70s, and here are 15 things that happened in that decade. I loved how you, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but one of the things that I really loved about the film is that when you started with John Lennon, you would tell the whole John Lennon story, and if the next story that you were talking about started before John Lennon, but for some sort of cultural reason it, t it went into the story this way, we would go back in time a little bit. That's and right. eventually we're moving through, but we're kind of... Rough chronology, not yeah. strict chronology, and also the willingness to just explore certain stories. And we had to have the courage to leave great stories out. And not for any particularly good reason, but I think over time, you know, kind of develop an instinct of what the story, what one, how one story is going to fold into the next. <laughs> Maybe a bit like, you know, building a magazine. But I mean, it, it, it became intuitive, but also disciplined in the sense that we had to focus on doing a few stories rather than superficially doing too many. Was there anything that you guys, uh, that sort of pains you that you had to leave out? The environment, 
I think the the magazine from very early on in the early 70s, Jan is very is a very passionate environmentalist, and they were covering the environmental movement very very early on. I was shocked at how early on, and they have covered it consistently to to this day. Jeff Goodell, Bill McKibben. I mean, the the, the magazine publishes great writing on it. At, at one point, we had wanted to include a story about the Exxon Valdez oil spill in the 80s, which was a phenomenal story by a journalist named um, Tom Horton, and. Yeah, it's 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 painful to have not gotten an, a, a good environmental story in there. Next question. I think this is our last question. Hi. So uh, earlier you were talking about how uh, you had un um, unseen footage of Yoko and John Lennon um, uh, in the documentary. So I was wondering if the documentary also features um, other un uh, never before seen footage of uh, different uh, musicians, and if there were also any of them that didn't make it to the documentary but you, uh, but you found and were surprised by? One of the things that I, it was sort of painful that we didn't get to include were some audio uh, interviews with Bruce Springsteen that were done maybe one of the earliest interviews with Bruce Springsteen, um, which didn't make it in. We have, we have a Bruce Springsteen section, which is great and has some, it's not never before seen, but has some pretty rare footage and, and pretty rare photos in it. The footage of him performing with the hat on and it's pretty great. Yeah, that's, that's from cool. uh, a Hammersmith Odeon concert, I think, in the early 70s. Um, so, yeah, that was painful not to include that audio. Um, there's a, there's a, some never-before-seen footage of the Rolling Stone offices and of Jan from 1969, which is some black-and-white footage that we found in San Francisco that Jan had never even seen himself. Um, so that was very exciting to show him. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of rare photos and footage kind of sprinkled throughout the film. Um, try and think of some more. I don't know, can you think of any? I'm trying to think of what else. Um, Are you talking about some, some of the stuff pistols. that we, we, we wish we would have shown? There are some very rare sex pistols. Very rare and expensive sex pistols <laughs> footage really? in the film. Yeah. Turns out the sex pistols make bank, or the yeah. people who film the sex pistols. Yeah. Make bank. No, that was. Uh, Good on Johnny Rotten. <laughs> uh, he, yeah. he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. um, guys, uh, I love the film, uh, both parts of it. Uh, when does it premiere? When can people watch? Next week. Next uh, week on HBO. HBO, November 6, part one, November 7, part two. Yes. Amazing. And Matt, what can we look forward to coming from you? What do you got coming down the pike? Uh, I've got a book that just came out last week uh, called I Can't Breathe, which is about the Eric Garner case in Staten Island. So it's out in bookstores now, so I definitely encourage people. Well, to I wish it. you would come back here, and we I'll read the book, and we can talk about it in full. Absolutely. We'd be I'm, happy to. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm holding you to that. Thanks, right. guys. Thank you. <laughs> guys, thanks so much for being here. Give them a round Thank of you so much.